Hello everyone, welcome again. So today's lesson will be on the metals uh, module of Year 11 Chemistry. And in this series, we're going to look at calculations involving moles. Okay, so in previous lessons, we've looked at what the mole is and how we use it as a unit of measure. And in this set of lessons, we're going to look at how we use the mole to work out other important things for chemical reactions, like how much of a particular reactant we'll need how much of a particular product we'll get, those kind of things. And that can all be done, of course, using the mole. Okay, so that's what we're going to be looking at. So in today's lesson, however, we're going to look at mass changes in reactions. So when, for instance, a metal and a gas uh, react together and form a single solid, that single solid will have a mass greater than the solid that we started with. Okay, that's because it's taken in um, the gas and added that to its mass. So obviously the mass of the product will be bigger than the mass of the solid reactant. Okay, and we're gonna look at how that actually happens and how we calculate these things. Okay, so the first thing we need to, know, uh, to, ne we need to study in uh, mass changes is the conservation of mass. Okay, so the conservation of mass is an important law which chemical reactions have to adhere to. Okay, so all chemical reactions follow the conservation of mass. And there's no exceptions in chemistry. Um, some of the physical reactions that happen in terms of things like nuclear reactions, uh, there might be some mass change, but that's covered by Einstein, so we won't worry about that. But in terms of like thermochemical reactions, so not thermonuclear reactions, in terms of the thermochemical reactions that you'll be studying, this it pretty much holds true, okay? For the physics students, you should be aware of the conservation of mass already, or some other conservation law, like the conservation of energy or momentum. So conservation laws are an important way for us to constrain, essentially, our universe so that we can um, study it in great detail. Okay, so it's just a bit of a constraint. So what is it? Well, in the simplest way, we can say it's that the mass of the reactants going into a reaction have to equal the mass of the products coming out of the reaction. Okay? Intuitively that makes sense because obviously if I'm putting something into a reaction and then getting something out, um, it should be the same in terms of its mass. I'm not changing anything. Um, but it's just a formal definition of something that we are already familiar with. So if I put, say, 10 grams of, a rea of reactants into a chemical reactor, there's nothing else in the reactor, just the chemicals that I put in, that 10 grams, they react. Then obviously if nothing's ha nothing is going on inside it, um, other than the reaction, then there's still 10 grams of mass there. So the products will have to be equal to 10 grams, okay? So you should know this just by sort of thinking about it logically, but it's just a formal definition of the things that we're already really familiar with. Now, historically, the conservation of mass is what turned chemistry, the chemistry that we know now as a science, it basically, this law helped chemistry evolve into a science from the pseudoscience of alchemy. So alchemy was always a, uh, was like a sort of like the astrology of science at the time. People thought they could turn things into gold. Uh, that was the sort of the dream to be able to turn something like iron into lumps of gold to then be rich, obviously. And then that slowly fell away um, to the more rigorous and scientific uh, methodologies of chemistry. And the conservation of mass was like pivotal to changing this alchemy into chemistry. So it's very useful um, historically. Now this conservation law, the conservation of mass, allows us to observe the mass changes of chemicals in chemical reactions. So it allows us to look at one chemical and see how its mass has changed when it's bonded to something else. And then allows us to figure out things about that reaction just by using the conservation of mass. Okay? So a particular part of your syllabus says that you have to study oxygen reactions. Now oxygen reactions, the reason why you study them is because historically oxygen reactions have always been the most common. You know, if you think about what's in our atmosphere, 
or standing all like floating all around me right now um, is oxygen as well as nitrogen and some other gases now oxygen is the second most abundant gas next to nitrogen but nitrogen doesn't react with anything so that's not very useful to us however oxygen reacts with pretty much anything that it can find so oxygen reactions were very common when science first started now oxygen is a very potent reactant as I mentioned and so reacts readily with lots of different substances okay this can be used to study the mass changes when metals are exposed to oxygen okay so here we have magnesium strip you should be able you should have seen magnesium strip in science at some point and down here is when magnesium strip or magnesium metal reacts with oxygen it forms magnesium oxide and that's down here okay this white powder and you can see they're very different so when metals combine with oxygen they tend to form ionic compounds so they tend to form ions when metals and oxygen combine okay so for example as I mentioned we have magnesium plus oxygen gas gives you 2MgO which is magnesium oxide and if you look at it it's clear that the MgO must weigh more than the Mg since oxygen has some amount of mass okay so if I was to do this reaction and I'd weigh the magnesium beforehand and weigh the magnesium oxide after I would notice that the magnesium oxide is significantly heavier than the magnesium and then if you think about it um, if you're a scientist you would wonder why because when this first was discovered because oxygen they didn't really know about and all of a sudden this magnesium metal goes from this nice shiny metal to this white powder and all of a sudden picks up a lot of mass so there's a big question about what's happening there so just because you can see that if you just take one mole of each of these substances this thing weighs like 24 grams per mole this is or one oxygen atom weighs 16 so it's already added about two-thirds of the weight um, to magnesium so this would weigh significantly more than this one okay so that concludes today's lesson on mass changes in reactions we looked at the conservation of mass which is the very important topic and also simple reactions where the mass of a solid will increase when it combines with a gas okay so we'll move on to the question segment now and hopefully um, the questions will expand your knowledge on this okay. so a group of students perform an experiment in which they burn 1.2 grams of magnesium and produce 2 grams of magnesium oxide. Calculate the mass of oxygen that has combined with the 1.2 grams of magnesium. Okay, well conservation of mass tells us that the mass of the products going in, uh, reactants going in, has to equal the mass of the products coming out. The mass of the product is 2 grams, the mass of the magnesium is 1.2 grams, so Okay, so here's our conservation of mass. The mass final equals the mass initial. So the mass of the magnesium oxide equals the mass of the magnesium plus the mass of the oxygen. And so your, you know, this is simple arithmetic. 1.2 plus MO2 equals 2. So the mass of the oxygen has to equal 0.8 grams. Okay. It's a very simple application of the conservation of mass. Calculate the percentage mass of oxygen in the MgO sample. So percentage mass this time. So what percentage of MgO is actually oxygen? Okay. So the percentage mass equals the mass of the oxygen over the mass total. And then times 100%. So 0.8 over 2 times 100% gives you 40%. Okay. So it's about 40% oxygen in this material. Okay. And if you think about the molar masses again, they sum to equal 40, and the mass of um, oxygen, molar mass of oxygen is 16. So 16 and 40 is, what's 16 and 40? Divided by 8. So you get 2 and 5, which is 40%. So that works out perfectly. Okay? Great. So moving on.
500 grams of mercury was heated in oxygen until it was completely converted to 540 grams of red-orange mercury oxide. Find the fraction by mass of the metal and oxygen in the product. So again, conservation of mass. The mass of the mercury plus the mass of the oxygen has to equal the mass of the, of the mercury oxide. So there it is. And so the mass of the oxygen is 40 grams. And you could probably calculate that in your head if you just read the question. Now the percentage mass of mercury is the same as before, mass of the mercury over the mass total. And so it's 500 on 540 times 100%. So it's about 92.6, well, 0.926, which is 92.6%, okay? Now the percentage mass of oxygen is the same, just 40 over 540. There you go. And it's 7.4%. And obviously these two have to sort of cancel out. They have to equal 100, sorry. They have to sum to equal 100. And if you add them together, they do equal 100. Okay. Calculate the mass of magnesium oxide, which forms when 5 grams of magnesium is reacted with oxygen. Okay. So now we're going sort of the other way. And this time we need moles to calculate it because we can't just say we can't do anything more because we don't know how much oxygen we need. Okay, so we start with a chemical reaction. 2Mg plus O2 gives you 2MgO. Okay, that's where we start. So we calculate the number of moles of magnesium. So it's just the mass over the molar mass. We've seen this equation a thousand times probably by now. So the mass of the, the moles of the magnesium is just 5 on 24.31, which is 0 0.2057. And then we use the chemical equation to derive a relationship between product and reactant moles. Okay, and the assumption here is that all of the magnesium is consumed by the oxygen. Okay? So the assumption here is that we've we've used up all the magnesium. Okay? So that's the sort of implicit assumption in these two statements. So the equation says that the number of moles of magnesium equals the number of moles of magnesium oxide. And therefore the mass of the magnesium oxide is just equal to the number of moles of the magnesium oxide times the molar mass of the magnesium oxide. And so 0 0.2057 times 24.31 plus 16 gives you 8.291 grams. So that's how much comes out, assuming we put 5 grams of magnesium in. And if you do the conservation of mass thing again, the amount of oxygen we used was 3.291 grams. Okay? Just this number minus that number gives you the mass of the oxygen. Okay? So this is how we use moles to calculate other things. So question 4. Calcium is reacted with chlorine to produce calcium chloride, and calcium chloride is used to de-ice roads, okay? So you throw it onto roads that are icy, and it would melt the ice. So if 10 grams of calcium chloride is produced, what volume of chlorine gas is required if the reaction occurs at room temperature and pressure, okay? So we start with the chemical equation, and that's just Ca plus Cl2 goes to form CaCl2. Then you calculate the number of moles of CaCl2. Okay, so it's just mass over molar mass. And 10 comes from the question. And these two numbers come from your periodic table. So 40 is calcium, and 35.45 is chlorine. And then you multiply by 2, because there are two chlorines in the molecule. Okay? And that gives you an answer of 0.0902 moles of calcium chloride. Okay. So then we use the chemical equation to derive a relationship between product and reactant moles. Okay. So if we look at the chemical equation, we'll see that CaCl2, the number of moles of that, equals the number of moles of Cl2. Okay, And that's good, that's easy. So then we know that the volume of Cl2 is just equal to the number of moles of Cl2 times the volume that one mole of an ideal gas takes up at 
standard temperature and pressure, which is about room temperature and pressure, so we'll just use this number. And then if you do the multiplication, you get 0.2516 liters um, is what you needed to make this reaction happen. Okay. Question five. Calculate the mass of magnesium oxide formed when 10 grams of magnesium burns in excess oxygen. So now, by saying excess oxygen, we know that there's more oxygen than is needed for magnesium to burn completely. So we don't have to worry too much about the oxygen. So again, we start with this equation. And then we just use the molar equation, n equals m over m. And so 10 over 24.31 gives you 0.411 moles of magnesium. And from the chemical equation, we can see that the number of moles of magnesium equals the number of moles of magnesium oxide. So you can see 2, 2, so the ratio is 1 to 1, because they've got the same numbers at the front. Okay. So the number of moles of magnesium is 0 0.411 just like the number of moles of magnesium. And so the mass of the magnesium oxide is just the number of moles of magnesium oxide times the molar mass of the magnesium oxide, which is 0 0.411 times 24.31 plus 16, which is 16.6 .6 grams. Okay. So that concludes today's lesson on uh, mass changes in reactions. We looked at the conservation of mass and how mass changes can occur with oxygen. And so hopefully you've learned something about a more or a more formal way of defining what you already knew about mass conservation. And hopefully you've learned how to do these calculations. This is a pretty standard setup for all chemical um, all chemistry mathematics. So all of the mathematics in chemistry only ever gets this hard. So in the next lesson we'll be looking at molecular and empirical formulas, so I look forward to seeing you at our next lesson.